We're very fortunate this morning and very blessed uh, to have a Christian author and uh, Merle Temple to come and share with us this morning. I've been very excited about uh, the opportunity to have him here. If you've not read his books, you need to do so. They're very thrilling, uh, very eye-opening. They'll touch your heart and life. I promise you they will. And uh, we want to give him all the time that he needs this morning. So Merrill, come on up and uh, share what God's laid on your heart, brother. Thank God you. bless you now. Thank you. Well, it's, it's uh, kind of tough to follow Lee after that. Uh, uh, that was a beautiful rendition of that song. And uh, for those of you who hadn't read my books and don't know, in uh, book two called A Rented World, uh, those are the last words uh, that Michael Parker speaks as he's walking up the hill to prison. Uh, for those of y'all who don't my, know my story, it was an unexpected detour, uh, but it was there uh, in prison uh, that God turned off the noise of the world uh, for me so I could hear him. And like C.S. Lewis said, he shouted at me through that megaphone of pain and said, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? It was there that uh, I learned to let my, my will yield to his will. I, the very independent person, uh, learned that uh, to surrender is actually to win and to die to self is actually to live eternally. And uh, so many lessons learned there. And it was there also where I learned to uh, stop begging God for deliverance and uh, only to uh, show me his uh, threads of good and purpose woven into crushing blankets of pain so that I might understand and become a better servant of Jesus Christ. Um, I, uh, I grew up in the uh, South in the 50s and 60s over in Mississippi. Uh, in those days, it seemed as though uh, the good guys always won and they wore white hats, and, uh, or so it seemed in the books and movies anyway, and in my naivete. Uh, but we all hunted and fished in the old days in the South, and uh, I was the one they always sent outside to... Uh, turn the little metal TV antenna where they would say, no a little to the right, no a little to the left, that's it, don't move. Uh, that was me and uh, uh, we grew up dreaming, uh, uh, performing chivalrous deeds and, and being the hero in, in all the uh, stories and rescuing the damsel in distress. And, um, you know, and then when I left high school uh, and went to Washington for a while to work for the FBI, Met J. Edgar Hoover and a lot of interesting people up there. Decided I'd better come home finally and go to college and at Ole Miss. And I did and I married my first wife, uh, Susan, who uh, ironically enough was uh, best friends with my current wife, uh, Judy. And uh, uh, so just as I was leaving Ole Miss, uh, President Nixon declared the first war on drugs in the early 70s. And uh, I was graduating with a a degree in criminal justice and I said well that must be the place for me so I left and went into that first as an undercover agent uh, then an investigator and eventually the first captain in the agency and while I was working undercover there weren't many of us and you got in trouble uh, no one was coming to rescue you because there just wasn't anyone and so I was held hostage uh, down in South Mississippi well, late one night uh, by guys who uh, if you read the books, uh, you'll see it fictionalized where they, uh, uh, they actually ate, uh, chewed up and ate double-edged Gillette razor blades, swallowed them, and then swallowed fire uh, to uh, cauterize the wounds. Uh, they, were, uh, they had serious issues. And uh, uh, I won't go into all of that that happened, but uh, next year after that, I was an investigator up near Memphis. And... Um, we had an organized crime stronghold just south of Memphis, much like the original Walking Tall movie, if y'all ever saw that. And in fact, some of the people out of McNary County, Tennessee, who were depicted in that movie, uh, were actually in this new syndicate there who had moved in and, and uh, paid off a lot of local officials. And we hit them one night, unbeknownst to anyone, and uh, they didn't take kindly to it and they issued a contract to have me killed and I was lured out by uh, two contract killers hired by the Dixie Mafia to kill me just south of Memphis under the pretext of giving me information. And uh, so I'll, I'll leave the rest of that story. Uh, uh, but in 1976, uh, when I was captain over the north half of the state, 
um, we were uh, uh, doing a heroin deal. We were doing a buy bust. We'd done bought, they'd bought heroin from the dealers before we were going to do a large amount uh, to draw out everybody behind them. And uh, we had this deal set up on the, on a day that turned out to be one of the coldest days in November and uh, 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 an ice storm like I'd never seen hit the state and just made everything from Jackson to Corinth just at one big sheet of ice late that night and it was so dark that day it looks like it was squeezing all the light out of the world and it was I was leaving my office to run down to the car to go meet the agents and set off the parameters of the deal um, I put my hand on a gear shift and just as I did the spirit filled up my car wrapped all around me all through me all in me and said go back and get the bulletproof vest and then it was gone it terrified me because I wasn't walking with God then I was a very nominal Christian I'd been raised in the church but just didn't understand the personal relationship with Christ at all and I thought what well, I'm losing my mind or have no reason to believe we need them uh, and they didn't like to wear them. We were bulky, even though it was cold and hard to conceal. And they would only stop up to a 38 caliber handgun. That was all we had in those days. So I put my hand on the gear shift again to leave. The spirit came in and filled up the car, wrapped all around me and threw me. And it wasn't optional. Go back and get the vest. I did. I said, okay, okay, out loud. And uh, not sure what was going on. I always knew I had the favor of God all my life. You know, but I didn't understand it, and I run from, I ran from it. I was sure that he was just really busy, you know, helping people who really needed him, and I would just take care of business, you know. And uh, uh, long story short, we got there. I got the agents to wear the vest, and a deal got away from us. And within hours, well, a few hours later, we were out on this uh, high road out right in the middle of nowhere, a uh, high embankment depressions on either side and a big railroad trestle that ran across and there uh, we didn't know they were planted on the railroad trestle behind a clump of pine trees they had a sniper there with a high powered rifle and when the agents began to do the deal and we were off on surveillance surrounding them as close as we could get as they went to do the deal uh, the sniper just opened fire and rained down high powered rifle fire uh, on the agents and we came across in a crossfire it was a it was a nightmare it was a terrible gun battle and gun smoke wafting across the hillside and and uh, we had wounded one of them they had wounded us uh, and a female agent uh, radioed me told me she was taking the wounded agent to the hospital and later when we a long story but when we secured the scene and the sniper had fled and I told everybody to quit shooting at shadows uh, I went to the hospital and I tried to comfort the young agent there, the uh, female, and arrested the violator she had wounded. And I walked into the ER and there they were cutting the clothes off the, uh, my friend and one of the agents who worked in our team and uh, who had been severely wounded and they were, and there was a vest that the spirit had commanded me to go back and get and it was white normally but it was crimson soaked in blood and uh, they were taking it off and uh, just as I walked up the ER doctor said Merle look at this he said he was hit in lower extremities he was sliced through his arm with a high powered rifle and this one hit him in the, in the chest and it penetrated the vest because it wasn't designed to stop a high powered rifle but it, when it punched through it took some of the punch out of it and deflected it so it went in behind his right breast and skittered around the barrel of his rib cage and popped out behind his left breast he said, Merle, if he hadn't had that vest on, it would have taken out his heart and lungs. He would have been dead before he hit the ground. I get chill bumps right now down to my toes, just like I did 40 years ago. Because you could just hear the shuffle of angels' feet, you know, uh, all around us there. And I knew that we were not alone, and I was not alone. And uh, you would think that I, were, that I would get it after all of that. I'd been through you know but I didn't I, uh, I kind of doubled down on my works based salvation plan which is really no plan at all and I uh, thought if I was just as good as I could be you know maybe one day it would all way out you know and the doors of heaven would swing wide open and they'd say come on in you know of course it doesn't work that way and uh, shortly thereafter I investigated a corrupt governor who was trying to infiltrate our agency with uh, folks uh, 
to spy on us and it didn't come out the way they hoped uh, so they were very upset and uh, things uh, happened that made un it untenable for me to stay uh, and because uh, people in government and power use that power to squelch or destroy anyone who gets in their way and often we don't understand that in the outside when we just read the headline and uh, don't know the story beneath it so I um, decided I had to leave and about that time uh, the bell system came along and ordered me uh, offered me a job as a security manager uh, to go into uh, their corporate world and to uh, investigate crime and corruption in the corporate world and I did and when I got there I found that uh, you know the more things change uh, the more they stay the same and it's kind of like the frying pan into the fire and I also began to uh, try to volunteer uh, in political campaigns, always searching for someone, a flag, a champion to follow. And I became uh, Ronald Reagan State Criminal Justice Chairman in 1980. And but there, in that uh, in that corporate and political world, uh, I began to see, you know, there was this unholy trinity of politics, crime, and business. And eventually, I was to find out that the uh, organized crime figures who tried to kill me were nothing compared to some of the political criminals uh, that I would ca encounter later in my life. I began to migrate across the company in many different jobs uh, for Bell and uh, first to Birmingham and uh, then to Georgia. I came uh, to Augusta uh, to uh, be the district manager here and uh, spokesman for the company and one reason I came here was because my first wife Susan uh, had severe health problems. Uh, she had many side effects from her type 1 diabetes she'd had since she was 11. So we came here because we heard about all the great hospitals here and the great health care and uh, uh, we were validated in that decision because uh, uh, they saved Susan's life uh, more than once in, in many long and torturous uh, surgeries and long stays in ICU and, and so on. Uh, so we were very blessed by that. Uh, but uh, the old fixer, uh, I'd been the fixer ever since I was a kid. Everybody always looked at me uh, and friends and family to fix everything and make everything right. But I couldn't, uh, I couldn't fix that uh, of Susan's. We could only, only uh, stall it and prolong it. Uh, I poured myself in, into my work here. Um, and on the face of it, you know, people have thought, wow, it's, uh, you know, it's, it seemed ideal. You know, I was chairman of this board and president of that fund drive and became very well known here in the Augusta area and uh, you know just uh, you know it was uh, the corporate jet out of Atlanta would stop through here sometimes and you know pick me up and fly me to Washington for evening dinners you know with politicos up there and uh, you know it was uh, you know, it might have seemed really really nice in the temporal sense uh, you know but it all left me empty uh, and hollow it wasn't filling up that big old hole in my heart and you know I hadn't yet learned uh, you know what C.S. Lewis also said and that was about uh, you know if you find that nothing in this world can can seem to satisfy that desire uh, you know that uh, that uh, nags you he said perhaps it's because you were made for another world and uh, but I didn't know that uh, the words from man piled up you know mostly in my closet and uh, I thought well if I just got one more award uh, one more recognition you know, you know then I'd be worthy somehow and uh, but it never worked like an addict seeking the next fix and the next fix it was less and less satisfying and pretty soon I wasn't even going to the award ceremonies I was off down the road trying to get another fix and you know, trying to push through that wall of complexity that I viewed in life. Uh, if I strained and tried hard enough and was good enough, you know, I could break through and there on the far side of complexity, you know, I would find uh, that elusive peace and that true truth uh, that I was seeking, you know, not knowing all along that it was uh, Jesus Christ right there with me, you know, every day and protecting me. Many things happened. We were here in Augusta. Uh, but one day, our congressman called me. I was close to him and had, uh, supported him. And uh, he called and he told me that, well, 
He said, we have a, you know, a ethically challenged uh, incumbent legislator here, and uh, uh, we're going to back a challenger uh, against him, and I would like you to secretly chair her campaign and to raise money for her, because the word had gotten out that I was, uh, you know, proficient at raising funds, and um, uh, so I agreed, knowing that there would be uh, consequences. I knew it wouldn't be easy because I knew who backed uh, the incumbent. And um, so we did that, and of course it leaked out. You can't go out and tell people you're supporting so-and-so and, and please give me a donation without that leaking out. And, and of course it did, and then one night the, um, uh, the incumbent called me at my house to scream at me and to tell me uh, and, and uh, that he said, I'm going to break up her marriage. I'm going to break up her family. I'm going to ruin her. I'm going to run her out of the state of Georgia. Do you hear me, Merle? I'm going to destroy her. Destroy her. And then another friendly call came in <laughs> from uh, uh, his ally at the uh, local paper here. And uh, uh, he said, you've got to, what are you doing? You've got to stop and cease this. And we don't want you involved. And uh, he said, uh, you know, the reputation you have here in the community, we, pl we played a large part in that. We made you, and we can break you. But I didn't withdraw. I doubled down times 10. And in the end, uh, the challenger beat the incumbent by a wide margin. And uh, some call it the greatest political upset in Georgia in uh, 50 years. But uh, the, the joy and the celebration were short-lived, as I knew it would be. Some local political figures here uh, called my superiors in Atlanta and told them that no political legislation for Bell will move until you punish him, until you silence him and mute him and just take him out. So I was summoned uh, to Atlanta uh, by the people who had named me their, their top manager in that department for 12 straight years. I was summoned there and uh, it was very harsh and very brutal. And they, the high-ranking officials looked at me in that room uh, it just filled with uh, sadness and sorrow and things I can't describe, uh, and they said, uh, who do you think you are? You know, no one cares about these little crusades of yours. Right and wrong don't matter. There's only the here and now. You know, you're going to stop all of this. You're never going to have another thought in your life. You're never going to utter another opinion. You're going to go back to Augusta, to East Georgia, and you're going to be a good boy, and you're going to make money for us like you always have. I was brokenhearted uh, to be treated that way by the company I loved, and uh, I asked, I couldn't accept it, I asked for uh, early retirement and a buyout of my pension, and uh, they granted it. They were stunned, but they, were, they granted it. So then the congressman uh, tried to rescue me and uh, with an appointment as U.S. Marshal for the Southern District under the, in the new Bush administration. Uh, things would have been good because Senator Coverdale, who I was very close to, and I was his uh, Georgia Drug Free Chairman in East Georgia, um, he would have had sole uh, appointing authority for the new administration as the, the only senator of his party at that time. Um, but Paul had passed away suddenly from an aneurysm, and so it fell into infighting amongst the congressmen. And some of them really weren't too keen on having a guy who had just defeated an incumbent, for after all, they were incumbents. And so after a while, we saw that no amount of uh, trips to Washington uh, and meetings were going to rescue that. And so we finally withdrew it. And, and into that void uh, stepped the Georgia Superintendent of Education. And um, I had been her East Georgia business chairman. Uh, I always loved to help people who were underdogs, and she was certainly the underdog in Atlanta, uh, being the, really the only Republican there in a sea of uh, a city that had been under one-party rule for a hundred years, and, and she was a woman. 
and that was no easy thing uh, in Atlanta in those days, believe me. So uh, she offered me a job as one of her four deputy superintendents. She had a vacancy. And so, you know, I should have refused it. I should have stayed home and just taken a long sabbatical and enjoyed my time, whatever time we had left with Susan, who she was so critically ill. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I didn't. I wanted one more great battle, uh, more dragons to slay, and I was going to show them whoever it was I wanted to show, you know, and uh, so Susan and I moved to Atlanta and got an apartment and I uh, accepted that job and I found that it was just so much worse than even I had imagined there. You know, it was a uh, brutal, a toxic environment and uh, so many wars of using proxies to go after this person and that person and uh, uh, the, the governor and the, the superintendent would at, at each other all the time because he thought she would run against him and she wouldn't do what he wanted her to do and and he supported the state board of education uh, and and that group that then was very partisan and uh, br brutal to poor career employees who had to test testify before them but they would hammer them uh, to try again as proxies to try to uh, to hurt the superintendent and uh, I used to see um, employees before and after the board meetings they would throw up be throwing up in the bathroom breaking out in hives and just shaking all over because they were terrified to go before that board it's just as bad as it was as bad as I can tell you it was just very little humanity to be found there and um, you know it was uh, in the midst of all that then the governor decided he wanted to build kind of a shadow government an extra legal government we called it and it uh, you know wasn't supported by the Constitution and actually to undermine some of the the constitutional officers elected by the people of Georgia and uh, so that began and then the informants it was like I was back in the law enforcement days informants uh, in other agencies began to call me and tell me what they were planning to do and they were morphing this agency into that and, and this and things that was never intended to be and bypassing the legislature and uh, trying to circumvent the constitutional state debt limit and finding friendly judges and uh, it was just uh, you know it was a movie you know, like some of the movies you've seen out of Washington except real and uh, and then uh, y you know the uh, the governor decided he needed money to uh, fund all of that and so he began to eye the nearly one billion dollars in, in federal education money we had coming in from Washington and um, he asked us for some of that money just to give it to him and we said no we can't do that it's illegal and uh, uh, so uh, they sent emissaries to Washington the US Department of Education you know to uh, ask them can't we just take this money and do what we want to with it and they, so they were horrified and said no and uh, then the assistant U.S. Secretary of Education called me from Washington one day and she said, look, we know what's, what's going on down there. And said, you hold the line. Earl, you hold the line. We'll prosecute anybody who diverts any of this money. Hold the line. Hold the line. And then she came to Atlanta in the presence of the U.S. Secretary, Rod Page, himself, and reiterated that charge. Hold the line. We're behind you. Hold the line. And then the, um, the call came from a friendly source in the White House. And they told us, y'all have been thrown under the bus. They've cut a deal with the Georgia governor to be the only governor of his party to endorse No Child Left Behind. A terrible bill, in my opinion. I don't think you'd find many teachers who would disagree with me. And uh, so then we saw the handwriting on the wall and uh, uh, then uh, the infamous conference call came in from Washington that I was totally unexpecting um, and uh, they called and said Mr. So-and-so uh, we're bridging you on to the conference call and I'm like what conference call and it was all of these politicos from all over Washington the White House uh, uh, USA who, who knows where all they were from and uh, it was all of them are shooting at, at us, at me, that day. And uh, they said, we've called to tell you 
that there's been a change. Um, and the Assistant U.S. Secretary and the Secretary himself are no longer available to you. And we, whoever they were, we have decided uh, that we're going to allow the diversion of that money and defer considerations of prosecution until a later date. A date which, of course, would never come. It was a straight-up political deal uh, outside the, the f uh, framework of law. And, uh, and uh, they said, uh, and furthermore, uh, to uh, make it easier to be diverted, uh, we're going to um, cease sending that money to the Georgia Department of Education. We're going to send it to the State Board of Education. And that was madness. It had never been done. It was totally illegal and outside the Constitution. And uh, like I said, the board is just a part-time group of people, you know, who had no means to receive or disperse money and no staff to speak of. And it was just uh, madness. It was like Wells Fargo calling the local bank and saying, look, there are bank robbers in town, so to hold down trouble, our armored cars is going to deliver the, the money right to the bank robbers. And uh, so then uh, after that, we uh, looked for ways to, uh, to move against that. And under law, the Georgia Department could take 5% off the top for cost of all money coming in. And that had not been done to hold down cost and push out every dollar we could to local schools. So the superintendent claimed that to keep it away from the board and started uh, uh, sending out money for test bed projects and to fund things all over the state. And the board was furious, but there wasn't much they could do about it because that was clearly within her authority. And during the midst of all of that, too, um, uh, there were leaks out of the department. We were scanning the, we were having Bell come in. I was calling my friends at Bell to scan our lines for wiretaps. Uh, there were moles inside the agency and uh, we were being hammered in the press and by all the surrogates of the other side everywhere we went and um, and in the midst of all that we even had to escort one of the deputies out of the building and fire him and escort him from the building because he had gone over to the other side and in the midst of that a retired state trooper called and had a meeting with us to say do you know how much danger y'all are in the word has gone out to some people not all people and most would ignore it, but the word has gone out even in some trooper huts that if, if y'all are, uh, if y'all are to be found out on the road campaigning or whatever, stop you and uh, harass you, arrest you, whatever they might do. And uh, it's hard to imagine. You think, well, that couldn't happen, but uh, unfortunately those things do happen. And um, uh, so in that, uh, in that moment of uh, paranoia and, uh, uh, the siege mentality took over and the inner circle shrank and shrank and shrank and it was like we were in the Alamo, you know, surrounded on all sides by Santa Ana. And uh, in the context of that, you know, the superintendent and I just became way too close, and much too close, and our relationship just became inappropriate. And uh, But in to follow that, a vendor showed up and a vendor said, he said he had great um, uh, products for uh, the state schools for the blind and deaf and those kids uh, never really got anything they were on the low low end of the totem pole in it in, uh, in atlanta and uh, the board hardly ever did anything extra for them they were an afterthought so the superintendent decided she wanted to do something to uh, help them and uh, at the same time help herself because the uh, the vendor had broadly hinted that uh, you know, he would support her campaign for governor because she had decided to go for broke and run for governor. And uh, so it was that moment, you know, when you things that are firmly in the no category in your life move over a little bit into the maybe. And when you decide, well, I'm going to defeat who I think are the bad guys, you know, you, you become a little bit like them. You know, you kind of step across that line, you get on that slippery slope. And those deals are made a lot, but, but you know that you have stepped out on that ice and you hear it cracking underneath you like you do in growing up on the pond in the winter when it's frozen you step out and you hear that sickening crack crack sound so uh, we did that and, um, and later uh, as things came to pass uh, uh, they would say that well um, they would say uh, those funds had been diverted 
uh, from blind and deaf kids. Uh, but that was totally not true. They it's made for a good headline, but it was totally not true. Uh, they had never gotten anything and wouldn't have gotten anything if the superintendent had not signed the contracts uh, with the vendor to send that to them. And it never got to them anyway because the state, state board stepped in and voided the contracts that she had signed because partly because despite crocodile tears, they wanted every penny they could to go to their patron downtown. So that's kind of how that works. And uh, so the, the superintendent lost her bid for governor. It was the longest of long shots, and, and, but she missed the runoff in the primary of about 1%. But uh, she lost, and uh, we all went home. And in uh, one dark night, the FBI showed up at my house. And the table was returned on the old law enforcement officer, and uh, they told me that, uh, ironically, we had been indicted for a diversion of federal funds. And, uh, you know, it was just as bad as I can tell you. I can't tell you how bad it was that night. Uh, just, uh, you know, unthinkable. Unthinkable. And how in the world did I ever get here? The person that most people would call the last of the Boy Scouts. How in the world did I ever get here? And it began to dawn on me what I had put at risk. Uh, and for what? You know, for this temporal moment, this temporal battle in a temporal world already fading away even as it is here today when, when you and I are here to talk and to worship Christ. Um, and I knew that I had put at risk uh, my position uh, as uh, Susan's caregiver that I had been for over 30 years, and that she needed me now worse than ever, and I put that at risk. It's one of those moments where you, you know, when you go, you pass a mirror and you stop and look at yourself and you say, who are you? I don't know you and I don't like you, and what have you done? What have you done? And then you just fall down in, in the bathroom and you just retch and retch and retch until there's nothing left but blood. And that belly full of rats is just gnawing at your insides and it won't let you go. And uh, I tried to minimize it as best I could. As I looked at uh, the federal conviction rate and I knew that virtually no one in, in the modern era now wins against the feds. Their conviction rate is 96 to 98 percent and they have many laws and um, you know it's harsh too when you uh, go to court and uh, try to uh, to win in court. Um, uh, so I decided to plea and try to minimize it as best I could and the superintendent told me where she wasn't because we hadn't done anything wrong that we were the good guys and I said, well, they have the laws. And uh, so I pled and I agreed not to have contact with her as part of my plea agreement. And uh, the prosecutor and I just never liked each other. Uh, there were brutal sessions we had when, when I was supposed to be their witness. Uh, and I felt like they were asking me to remember things that uh, maybe didn't happen. And, and one night I lost my temper and I lost my mind. And I contacted uh, the superintendent to tell her that I would... Uh, um, that I would be an honest witness on the stand and I, by law I was everyone's witness on the stand and I would tell the truth about all that happened with Washington and the diversion of the money and all that kind of stuff. Well I didn't know then that she was taping me. There was some bitterness there I think and uh, uh, she, uh, she taped me in the morning I was going up to uh, prepare to testify I didn't know she had gotten up there early and she had uh, pled guilty. And as she was leaving the room, they told me she turned, reached in her purse, and got the tape and said, uh, you might want this, and tossed it to the agents. You know, getting, it was nothing to benefit. And when I arrived, uh, they were upset and uh, the prosecutor was screaming at me again. And uh, uh, they arrested me without warrant for obstruction of justice. And they shackled me, and the marshals drug me off to the Atlanta Correctional Facility where I couldn't testify in the vendor trial. And they changed the whole truth. The truth that we had agreed upon over here, where I was going to testify to, and other witness, m witnesses mostly corroborated, they changed that whole truth and moved it over here then to paint me as a central figure and use the superintendent to testify against me. And so there I was in the Atlanta facility in 
solitary where they'd put me because the case was so high profile they afraid the guys in there might kill me and uh, I had become addicted to Xanax in the midst of all that stress that my doctor had given me and really uh, had ignored how dangerous Xanax withdrawal could be until they made me go cold turkey in there and uh, people got word out to my wife that they thought I was about to die and they sent and she raised the roof and people came down they found me uh, incoherent and unresponsive and they took me out in the middle of the night to the hospital and the officers who took me to the hospital downtown that night uh, you know down the back streets of Atlanta in the middle of the night uh, uh, they began to tell me they thought they would just kill me and dump my body in the Chattahoochee you know and uh, I wanted to believe they were just being cruel but in that situation where you're shackled and helpless in the back streets that loud at midnight you're really not so sure and uh, finally after recovering in a, in a ward for a couple of weeks um, they brought me back to the same place but when we did praise God somebody brought me a Bible and it was there that uh, God broke me in that cell and down on my knees I surrendered and I was truly born again amen and, and immediately men in there hardened men who had never seen me they knew I was there began to flock to my door and they came to that big metal door where I wasn't allowed out and they would sit on the floor and look through that little slot and stare at me and began to confess crimes to me heinous crimes murder you know everything that you can imagine and I didn't know what was going on I didn't know what they sought from me I felt so inadequate and I asked God you know Lord what is this and he showed me you know that uh, in your works based salvation and trying to be a good guy you were you were extending that helping hand to people to pull them up but you're brought down now into a world where you would have never known before so that you can know and understand Christ and his coming down to suffer for the and die for the world and uh, so uh, many good things happened there and then I decided to try for second bail which no one thought I could get after all that had happened because I knew I wasn't getting any good deal anymore or probably no time or very little time or probably probation that that was gone with the wind and uh, so but I, I went to the hearing and um, despite the best efforts of the prosecutor uh, the judge wasn't buying any of it and he he ordered them to let me go home and get my affairs in order and provide for Susan's care and everything and then a screaming match broke out and the prosecutor jumped up started telling the federal judge what he couldn't do and believe me that's just not really something you want to do in a federal court is to tell a federal judge what he can't do and uh, he threatened uh, you had to gavel up to hit him with contempt and uh, so forth and uh, but I went home and after I got home Susan had had heart attacks and stuff and she had another stroke and it was just uh, it was just a sorrowful time and when I left her that day uh, left her with nurses and friends at the house and she was in her wheelchair that was uh, truly the hardest day of my life and then I went up to prison uh, surrendered at Edgefield a friend took me and I went in as we were being processed and strip searched once again one of those many indignities that you go through time and time again uh, I was going up the hill and um, uh, 535 men were waiting to see me because they had heard about the case and it was local papers and news to them in Edgefield and they had seen the superintendent on WRDW in a serialized interview with, um, you know claiming victim status and uh, telling her side of the story and uh, they decided well they were just going to make life really hard on me and some of the staff did too but the Christians came to me the Christians on the inside some of the truest and best Christians uh, not just professing but confessing Christians came took me under their wings and showed me that I was not alone and showed me how to be as safe as I could be there and um, and uh, so that journey of 2,000 nights inside uh, began and uh, Susan would come to see me when she could uh, the nurses would bring her and and um, and then one day I got the call that she had died they told me at home with her nurse without me where I should have been 
that she woke up one morning, looked up and said, Mama, Mama, is that you? And uh, then she was gone. And uh, when they got the word to me, that was the next hardest day in my life. And uh, uh, my lawyer said uh, he applied for me to go to Susan's funeral, only uh, 30 minutes away. And uh, But they said, no, we don't have an officer to escort him. And we were offered to pay for off-duty. And uh, they said, uh, no. And the federal judge in Atlanta issued an order, ordering the Bureau of Prisons to take me to that funeral 30 minutes away. And in a very unusual move, they defied a federal judge and appealed it to the appeals court knowing it would just run out the clock on me. There was no time for an appeal because it was only like two or three days to her funeral. But out of that sadness, um, you know, uh, there were opportunities because it gave me standing to witness to other men who were suffering and couldn't go to funerals and to talk about about God to them and what he had done for me and then the Lord showed me he wanted me to start a prison ministry on the inside and everybody said oh that can't happen you know an inmate you're nothing but an inmate and uh, but we did we we with the help of friends and, and 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 the Lord we began to get movies in and we started a Christian movie night and uh Men came, uh, we started showing those movies every week, and it was a highlight of their days to come. They knew TV, and they knew movies, and they wouldn't darken the door of a church, but they came to our Christian movies, and there in the dark, packed out with standing room only, you know, I'd hear these big, tough men begin to weep. And their hearts opened and softened to the approach of the Holy Spirit, and men were accepting Christ, and... And, uh, you know, we'd go on to do those at all three facilities where I, where I was, and we believe it was the most successful uh, inmate-led ministry ever led, ever in the Bureau of Prisons. Thousands of men exposed to the gospel of Christ. And, and um, that uh, one day that uh, a man who had resisted and resisted, um, uh, it finally came to one of the movies, and because he was surrounded by trouble and he said just leave me alone Merle and leave me alone and he finally said okay I'll come if you'll shut up if you'll leave me alone and that night it was another great night men were crying I walked back up the hill and I was in my room by myself sitting on my bunk praying and I said Lord thank you for tonight but Lord why am I still here why am I still here and at that very moment I could hear a clearing of a throat and I looked up at my doorway and there was that man that I had hounded to come uh, and he said am I interrupting Merle I said oh no and he said uh, he said oh Merle he said I thought there was no way out of my troubles he said but tonight there in that uh, chapel listening to the words of Christ he said I knew exactly what he wanted me to do he said thank you thank you for staying after me and when he walked off I looked up and I said thank you Lord because I knew that was my answer and as I continued to, to deal with the loss of Susan uh, and uh, uh, one day I was uh, kind of wallowing in, in my bed of pity and uh, laying there with my headphones on and little, little hit earpieces and we could, if we held our nose right and the wind was just right, you know, we could get a, law, a Christian station, distant broadcast. And I was laying there wallowing in my pity and um, uh, nothing but static in my ears and all of a sudden it just went crystal clear. Transmission broke out of that static. And a voice I had never heard, and I had, and I never heard again, said, "You there, you there," and it was so direct. I, I half sat up and opened my eyes. He said, "Yes, I'm talking to you. It's not noble what you're doing, lying there in your bed of pity. Now you get up and you get about your father's business." And I did. And uh, as I said, the ministry went on. There's so many stories I could tell you. And I'm writing book three now. I promised God I'd write three books inside. Um, fictionally telling my story, uh, inspired by that, and his story of redemption and salvation. And I would go out all across the country to show people my redeemed life, that they might want to meet my Redeemer. And Judy and I have been here, there, and everywhere, and went, even went out to Hollywood. They called us out there. I want to tell you there's no shortage of people to witness to out there. 
and uh, but uh, God's hand is in all of it opening doors that everybody told us could never be opened schools picking up my first book to teach in middle and high schools and one college making it required reading and Adrian Rogers old church and in Memphis, Bellevue has a, both of them in their library and they stay checked out. Their favorites there and, you know, had a private meeting with Robbie Zacharias, the great Christian apologist who I learned so much from in Atlanta. And, you know, God is just all out. I'm just so grateful he can use somebody as pitiful as I am to be, uh, to be his instrument. And thankful he gave me a second chance and we serve a God of, of second chances. And, uh, so I will tell you, as I tell everybody, you know, when you look at uh, people in prison or in any kind of hardship or you hear something about them and you think they're this person or that person, they're all kind of prisons, prisons of the heart and mind, and there are a lot of people on the outside who are in those prisons, and all of those people are deserving of our love and our forgiveness. And uh, I said, we have a bad habit of wanting to freeze people, you know, who we think they were yesterday or five years ago. And I always tell them, aren't you glad God didn't do that? to us before he sent his son to die for us on the cross you know and uh, sometimes when I'm attacked by non-believers I tell them well I, I hear no love from you you know but uh, but I love you because he loved me when I thought I was alone and unlovable Jesus walks out here on Washington Road he, uh, he walks along my road to prison he walked among the rows of the prison beds. Uh, the Messianic government in Washington can't stop him, and prison bars couldn't keep him, keep him out. And uh, like the old hymn says, he got the whole world in his hands. And I ask people, you know, whose image is on you? He owns everything. And so uh, just so thankful and blessed to, to be here today and uh, that God gives us these opportunities. And you'll just never know how much it meant to me that, uh, that y'all let me come here and... Uh, and tell you my story today because among men uh, you know I count myself as most blessed you know I got nothing that I once asked for but everything I could have hoped for and thank you and God bless you